All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is another episode of the Jackson Podcast. I'm here with Rob Holding of Arsenal, a professional football player, an amazing athlete. And today we're going to dive deep a little bit and learn a little bit more about him and kind of uncover some things that we didn't know. Hopefully he'll spill the beans on things that we don't know about and give us a little inside look at professional football. As we say in America, professional soccer. So, Rob, it's amazing to have you here, first of all. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Appreciate you traveling across the pond to be on our podcast. (laughs) Um, I think I just want to kind of start off with like explain how you started in football and kind of at like what point did you know you wanted to be a professional football player? Yeah, so I was started when I was like five kicking a ball and playing for like a local team. Mm-hmm. So in England, they do it like we have the academy system that I think is just starting to take off here now in, in America. It's some some clubs are having academy systems. And um, so we go through from eight, nine, 10, 11, all the way up to your 18 when you're coming out of high school. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, from then I was playing and got picked up by a team called Bolton Wanderers that's based up in North near Manchester, which is where I was from. And yeah, so all the way through the ages, 12 years of my life, every night, three nights a week, going to, driving up to Bolton, which was like an hour drive from where I lived in Manchester. And then as I got to like 16, when you, we leave high school and you start being an apprentice, so you start getting a little bit of money and you start seeing the first team and you sort of in reach with the first team. I think that's when you think I can actually maybe make a living off this and do this professionally. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and then made it through there, played first team for six months. And then that summer, Arsenal came in and I've been at Arsenal ever since, seven years down there. So how does the, like the academy side, like as a kid, you're like eight, nine, 10, like Mm -hmm. how how do you even get into a system like that? So it's, they have scouts that go out and they're watching kids from like five, six, seven to see if they've got the potential to be in their first team. That's That's the end goal. So yeah, I was, playing for my local, local team, which is just anyone can really join in and play. And uh, obviously if you've got a bit, you can stand, you stand out. Yeah. And yeah, scout came up to my dad after one of the games and just said, oh, this is who I am. I represent Bolton, uh, Bolton Wanderers. Yeah, we'd like your son to come and train with us and join in with like one of the academy teams. Now, like going into that system, you've also like had to develop your own style, right? You have like a unique mm-hmm. style and that obviously probably separates you from other athletes. And, yeah. and other players. Yeah, the, the young age at academies are quite technically based. So uh-huh. it's just literally technical work, not really going into too much tactical detail. There's a little bit, but that doesn't come until you're a bit older. Um, so yeah, it's all just like simple passes, simple tricks. And then it's seven aside as well. So we have to, I don't think we play 11 till I think when you're thir- under 13s, 14s, you start playing 11 aside and that's when it becomes men's football. And that's when you have a little bit more tactical and... So, so as training. a kid, it's more of the basics. They're looking at you to see if you have the yeah, basics. Yeah, just see or what if you've got that like coordination. If you've got just mm-hmm. that ability with a ball, you're just a natural with it. Mm-hmm. That they they're looking for that. So as you go into that next level of your career, you're obviously a child, and you're going through your teens. You know, 13, 14, 15. You're still young, mm-hmm. but they want you to obviously be professional, respectful. You know, they yeah. want you to be mature. What kind of defenders? What kind of players did you model your game after? What kind of players did you look towards to help you kind of guide you to the next step? Yeah, so I was I was a United fan, like Man United fan, growing up, mm-hmm. and um, so the big two, the position that I play centre back, the two best players that were playing in the league really at the time was Rio Ferdinand and Nemanja Vidić when they played with yeah. each other together, and they were like they have like unbelievable chemistry with each other. One's like really ultra aggressive from like Vidić, whereas. Rio Ferdinand has that bit more of a classy feel and just sort of swept up and could go into the duels, but was just more of a tidy on the ball sort of ball playing centre half, which is like Mm -hmm. the way the modern football went, especially with uh, Rio. So yeah, that was who I was always looking up to and trying to get to as many United games as I could and just watch them and see how they play and how they hold themselves. And did you have like certain drills and certain things or certain foods you would eat that would help you kind of stay a little bit above par or better than the rest to separate yourself? Because you obviously have to stand out. Everybody's good. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to get to that next level. For sure. And that was the hardest thing going through like schools and stuff because you're with your mates and as they (laughs) get older, they want to go out and have like a beer or whatever, or they want to just go and have fast food and stuff. Yeah. Thinking I've got training tonight. Like I don't want to be going to training with a load of fast food. So it is, there is stuff like that and little sacrifices you have to make. But I know it was all worth it in the end, for sure. Was there was there certain weightlifting or certain ball drills or certain, like, coaches or people that helped you get through those systems, like, as a kid? For sure, for sure. So I had a, um, when I was at Bolton, I was sort of just before breaking into the first team, I felt like I, I was quite a skinny, I still am quite a skinny lad, but, like, I was just tall. And um, I had to build a bit of muscle and a bit of that power. 
So we started doing like Olympic powerlifting. Oh, wow. When I was in like, when I was 17 or 18 in the youth system at uh, uh, Bolton. And yeah, I feel that really helped me and just give me that power. power. Lifting. Yeah, so like- how did, you, how did you figure out powerlifting out of all things? Didn't it make you like stiff or tight? No, because you do, we, you do a load of mobility work as well. Like every morning you'd be doing like, yeah. like hurdles and doing like mobility work with hurdles. So yeah, we'd go into like cleans and hang pulls. And we never like lifted it up above our heads. It yeah. wasn't like, it was just literally getting it up there yeah. and then like being power from your base really. That's good. Is there someone that kind of pointed you in the right direction to try to figure out that that is what you needed to do or did you kind of do your own research? Like, I think it was like a mutual thing between me and the strength and conditioning coach at the, at the time. Like yeah. a lad called Jack Fay. We, uh, we saw, I just said like, I'd, I'd like to do better, more exciting, better mm-hmm. ways. Cause like just sitting under a squat rack and squatting all the time. Sometimes it's nice to get a little bit of a full body yeah. workout with it. And yeah the noise and just like when you hear the bar jingle or whatever, it just get that, you feel like you're lifting yeah. and you're getting that power. I mean, I can imagine everybody at that level is trying to take it to the next level and everybody at that level is good. So exactly, how do you yeah. separate yourself? It's, it's, well, yeah, it's that's amazing. Exactly, that's, an, that's another little thing that maybe separated myself. And some lads might look at it and be thinking like, oh, why is he doing that? Some yeah. lads might join in. And if they join in, our team becomes maybe stronger and better. So yeah, going into a, a game and like going into a match, can you like tell me what it feels like? Like, give me the routine. I want to kind of know as a player, like, you wake up and you have a match that day, like any superstitions, what are you doing? How do you prepare for a game day? Like it's, it's next level. So for me, I've never really been superstitious in terms of that, but I know some of my teammates have that, like the left sock has to go on first and then the right (laughs) sock and then the left boot, right boot. Whereas mine just sort of, as it happens, it happens. And I'm not really fussed about it. Um, Other lads are quite religious and they have like the Bibles and they're a Quran, like Moel Nene, our Egyptian player. Mm -hmm. He's, got his towel out, like goes into the bathroom, washes his hands and feet and does his like prayers and stuff. Wow. So we just give him a private bit in the change room where he can pray and it has to always obviously face Mecca. And so he's had his compass out and found where, which work, which corner it is. So it's, it's crazy. Like the different cultures that we come across, especially in like European leagues. But yeah. It's, um, it's cool. And do you have anything that you do like day of, of a match? Like, do you have to eat anything specific? Do you have to stretch? Do you do anything like that leading into the yeah, game? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So like my breakfast is always like this year we had pancakes and obviously pancakes, you think like really, but just that you just want to carb up and that's an easy carb to have in the morning rather than having a bowl of pasta. You're loading it with syrup? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> pancakes with syrup before, oh, yeah. before Berries, a Premier blue, League game? Blueberry, that's the secret? Yeah, that's what, I, that's what wow. I go for, yeah. And then what about in terms of like stretching or playing? Like I see a lot of people like they're, they're passing and they're doing drills on the field. Doesn't that make you like extremely tired like before you have to play? Uh, nah, you're always okay with it. It's, not, it's normally like, it's a bit light on the feet. I, I quite enjoy in the changing room before we go out. We have like a little pre-activation area. So I'll okay. do a bit of foam rolling, a bit of stretching, uh, some glute band, bit of activation and stuff. And then I always like to have a little game of two touch with the ball. So just getting a feel for it, even without your boots on, our trainers just in socks, just getting a feel for the ball. And then you go out and you do your warm up and you're straight into the game, yeah. So in terms of like the Premier League, it's obviously the best football in the world. You know, everybody would probably argue that. And, you know, we see this level of play and we see the level of soccer talent that, you know, people have never seen before Mm -hmm. coming in and out of this league. How do you manage and how do you adapt to the game? Like, how do you kind of prepare yourself to constantly stay so innovative so that way you're staying at the height of your Mm -hmm. own personal career? Yeah, that's that is literally, that's like the mental side of the game to stay so concentrated for that long because Mm -hmm. you're late to an action after a split second the ball's past you, the guy's past you, whatever. And it's probably similar in the NFL. Like if you're not switched on for that yeah. one second, the speed that the lads play at, you're, you're just left left the dead. So the concentration aspect of it, that's why you see so many late goals because people are just drained after concentrating for 90 minutes and, and physically drained. They, you just, you lose track and boom, there's a goal. So, And playing, playing in this league and obviously playing against some of the best talent, who has been like your biggest influence on the field, on the pitch? As in... As a teammate wise or against? Like as a teammate. Um, oh, per, per Mertesacker. Per Mertesacker and Lauren Koscielny when, when they were together and at the club, they were, they were phenomenal. Per Mertesacker like won the World Cup with Germany, led them to that mm-hmm. just absolute leader. Like anything that he'd, anytime he spoke, everyone listened and everyone was quiet. Really? Yeah. And he was strict, but he did it in a good way. Where strict he, in what way? Oh, if you're like, if you're on your phone when you shouldn't be on your phone. Really? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We had like fine lists and stuff. And because that was how I got my first fine at, at Arsenal. I had a phone call from my agent and there was no one in the changing room. And I just like answered it quick. And then next thing you know, he walked around the corner and he was just like, 500 quid tomorrow. I was like, fuck. 
<laughs> yeah, I just actually, like, oh, yeah, they, I don't actually make like, you pay it. To be fair, he let me off because he likes me. And he, yeah. knew that, he knew that I'd never do anything like that. So he let me off. But yeah, that was... Wow. So you guys as... as Grown men and professional athletes are getting fined picking up the phone. They picking up the phone. Yeah, they, I should have gone outside the changing room and like. What was the worst fine you ever saw by a player on um, Arsenal? Oh, people are late for training. Yeah, they would be late for training. Yeah, there was one last year that I won't name him because I don't want to name him. Yeah, team. yeah, don't but name he, drop uh, your team. Yeah. I got you. He, uh, yeah, he just he was just late. He got stuck in London and then couldn't get out with the traffic, and so we just started training and we're starting to warm up on the pitch, and he's literally just turned up and just ran out in his. Ran in, got changed, ran straight out. And we're like, where that you can miss like two meetings in the morning. So that was like the biggest one. And yeah. does he get fined a lot of money on that one? Yo, he would have got a bit of money on that. Would have been it would have been four figures for sure. Wow. Yeah. So you don't want to show up late to an arsenal practice? No, no. And match days like even worse. <laughs> What's on match days? I don't know. I can't remember the top of my head because no one's ever late. So we don't really yeah. we have we agree to him, but we don't like do you know. guys all stay in the same house before a match? Like how do you guys We go all... hotel hotel? Oh really? Yeah. So like say we have a home game, three PM kickoff the next day. Uh the day before we'll meet at the stadium in the evening and um all have like our dinner mm -hmm. at the hotel and then stay the night, breakfast pre match at the hotel. And then we all go to the game. So like you're never late for a game. Yeah. It's maybe like turning up to the mm -hmm. hotel, the stadium the night before you might, people. And might then after a game, does everybody got to go back in the same bus? No, no. I'll, so you drive to the stadium. We all pack our cars up, get on the team bus. So our, our cars are just ready. At, got to it. Go after, yeah. Got it. And is the chemistry pretty, pretty tight for you guys always to be staying at the same hotel, going on the bus? Yeah, is that sure. where like a lot of chemistry is built? Yeah. And I say that's the best thing about how Arsenal has been the last two, three years with Mikel Arteta coming in. The camaraderie between the team, it, I think, I think, because the team's quite young, we've got like the youngest team in the Prem, I think, and everyone's just everyone talks to each other. There's no like little clicks or anything, and I think that's what's made us be so successful last year, and then hopefully next year. Yeah, and we see obviously you guys are playing phenomenal, so there's yeah, got to be a reason for that. Everyone's just in sync, yeah. And and do you feel like that's the leadership from the office and on the and on the team, like the teammates? For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Definitely the two signings that we made with like Zinchenko and Gabriel Jesus this year and, and Jorginho coming in mid mid year. Like that's an experienced guy that's won Euro European competitions with his national team. He's won the Champions League with Chelsea when he was there. Mm -hmm. So he's coming in with a load of experience and he yeah. knows how to how to link a change room that's got different nationalities and stuff. So he's, he's yeah. been, he's been how, how does that work? Having a team with so many different religions and nationalities and players? Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough at times. And especially like new lads sign in, like we had the new Polish guys uh, sign in Jakub and he couldn't, he couldn't speak English. He, he had like very little, hello, how are you? Good. That was it. And you can't, and he was sat next to me in the changing room. So I was like trying to talk to him every day because I'm quite a talky person. And um, he's just, and to be fair, by the end of the season, so six months after he arrived, we're actually having little conversations and he was telling me about how he's getting married this summer and stuff like that. So oh, I was wow. like crying out, he's picked it up real quick. Wow. Is the language barrier hard on the team or you guys got translators? Uh, no, no, everyone, everyone, everyone speaks English to be fair. Got uh, it. We, English people are quite lazy in terms of the fact we just expect everyone to be able to speak English. <laughs> so you guys aren't learning new languages. No, no yeah. one's studying. Like you do it in school, but then it just gets dropped quite quickly. So how valuable is getting practice and getting reps against like Sokka and Odegaard and all these different players? Like how valuable is that? Like, how does that play into your skill? Yeah, that plays to our advantage massively. So you look at, especially Odegaard and Saka this year, they've had great seasons. Like, yeah. I think Odegaard scored like 15 goals from, from open play, which is like a tied the record with the Bruyne mm -hmm. midfielders. And obviously Bakayo's just done Bakayo things and just <laughs> ripped it up like he does. Yeah. So we're training against them every day. And they're ripping up the Prem each week. So to be getting them five days a week experience against them, and then you're coming up against players that might yeah. not be as good as them, you're you're ready for whatever you're going to face, you know? Is there something specific you look for them to bring to you at practice? So like, Bikayo's someone who will square you up and take you one-on-one, -on -one, which is a defender. That's when defenders have to be good in 1v1 situations. Whereas Martin's more of a defend, uh, attacker, sorry, that like drops off the defend, defender and okay. into like these weird spaces where... Defenders are unsure, should I go into that space or am I opening up space behind me to be attacked? And then he'll turn and then slot passes down the side of you. So like they're the, they're tricky ones. And Bikayo's like just raw pace and power and just faces you up and he'll yeah. knock it and you've got to be able to get there before he does, you know? It's amazing how you break down right now, like how a, a player is attacking the goal and attacking the, the mm -hmm. space on the field. How is you as a defender, how do you kind of like dial in the ways you should prepare for a game? Like, are you actually looking at footage or tape? How do you know what these players are doing in those oh, for sure. situations? Yeah. So this is another like one in the changing room before a game. 
we have like a couple of coaches and like one of the assistants or whatever will be walking around with an iPad and he'll have the, their starting team will come out and he'll we'll go and sit down and go through like their front three, let's say like the striker, the two wingers, and we'll go through that and um, watch little clips of her previous games and see what their tendencies are. Wow. So you can be ready to, what to expect. So if it's a guy that I've never seen before, so we sometimes play in Europe and the players that we never really come up against. And so we've got no idea how they play as an individual. So we watch them clips and just get an idea. You know what foot he is. So if he's defending him, I'll show him to his weaker foot and stuff like that. Wow, that's crazy. So a lot of the preparation for these big games comes from tape, kind of yeah, like yeah, understanding sure, how these sure. people play. And, and, and Arteta has been massive with that yeah. through the through the days prior to the game, like going through the, as, them as a team, breaking them down as a team. And then we go a little bit more individual yeah. with uh, specific coaches and stuff. How's it been playing for him? It's been amazing. It's been amazing for like the, the changes that I've seen at Arsenal. And obviously I've seen three managers now. I had uh, Arsenal Wenger when I first signed for mm -hmm. two years. I do now I am Rifford around two years and now I've had Mikel for free. So it's his culture and the way he's just come in and sort of like became the boss of the club straight away is has been great and it's made everyone he gets he gets that respect instantly so everyone's just everyone's just bought into it and that's why we've, i think we've yeah been successful. i mean obviously we're seeing huge success from the team and the mm -hmm. team's playing better than ever it's got to come from somewhere yeah exactly. do you think that there's something that makes a team super successful besides good talent is there something specific that a team needs at that level yeah because you could have talented players you could have seven unbelievably talented players in mm -hmm. your team but if they're on not in sync and working from the same song sheet let's say mm -hmm. then you're gonna you're gonna struggle and things aren't gonna happen and how does a team like yourself with such amazing talent kind of stay in sync i think that's just repetition on the, really? on the practice field yeah, yeah for sure and and is the practice like super structured or are you guys yeah. playing just games no, no yeah super structured. like at your level do you guys still need a drill and still we, need we, to work we, on we, footwork yeah well, yeah for yeah. sure yeah yeah for sure we'll do like specific training with like one of the assistant coaches or grab the defenders for a back four session and we'll do defending crosses like that are specific to what we need and really and so you're still there, at yeah. that level or drilling certain things yeah because it's it not is, just games yeah because you come a, you come to a game like most games that i've played at arsenal we've been quite in control with the ball so then like you have to defend that one cross that you've not defended in three weeks because you've been so dominant in games so you wow. have to have it just like keep it ticking over and keep yourself sharp in, on that specific skill yeah who do you think is the most talented player you've ever been able to play with so yeah, that'll be, I mean, a lot of Arsenal players have always said Santi Cazorla because of just both feet technically is so clean. And I agree completely. And I think he was, he was great. But Mesut Ozil just used to do these little magic things and you'd see little glimpses and just in training and think. I remember a session actually when Mkhitaryan had just signed and we did a possession and them two were on the same team and they just ran it round us just pass into each other, barely using anyone else. It was frightening. I've never seen, and I thought we're going to win the league. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was like, well, these yeah. guys are just going to rip it up now and they're going to be, they're going to be incredible. And yeah, he just, his, his football intelligence is so high. So high. When someone has football intelligence for people that don't play soccer or football and people that do play, there's, there's something there that makes someone better than someone else, obviously. Mm -hmm. And yep. a lot of people have to have football intelligence to play in the league. Yep. For you to be at your level, you have to have football intelligence. Yeah. But what makes someone have that higher IQ? I feel like it's the, the way they see the field before they're even involved in the game. Got it. So a lot of people just are quite reactive off things that have happened. Whereas okay. they're proactive and they're thinking ahead. Like, I'll leave them to play that little game and I'm going to find myself over here. So when we're yeah. ready, that ball's coming to me. And I know exactly how the back line's set up and mm -hmm. they're constantly looking away from the ball and looking at the spaces. And I think Meza and Odegaard's another one that's like that. So they're quite similar in terms of like the way they play. And he just, he sees the field different and can know what, what he wants to do and do it faster, which makes it even harder to defend. In terms of the Premier League, we know like the, the fan bases are passionate and we know that, you know, these stadiums, these arenas could be crazy. Mm -hmm. And we know that obviously it plays a big part in games, right? Having sure. a strong team behind you and a strong like momentum, you know, that momentum, momentum feel for sure. Yeah. What's the craziest arena stadium you played at? Craziest fan base? Um, definitely in the Premier League, Anfield at Liverpool. Yeah. That's like, we were 2 nil up and suddenly there was like an action and their crowd just lifted and got aggressive. And you could see it boost their players. Their players then look a bit taller, run a bit faster. So it is a, it is a tough, tough place to go and like take all three points. And we, we should have, to be fair. We just, they, 
the cop just sucks the ball into the net. Like it's weird, it's like this energy that's just like pressure, pressure, and then it breaks through. So yeah, that, definitely Liverpool. We did play a game against Red Star Belgrade um, in the Europa League and their fans, crazy fans. Really? Well, luckily, luckily, they've just got like an athletics track around the pitch. So you're a bit distant Why from them. Why are they it. crazy? Just flares going off, smoke. Like there's like when you like play- How do you this, play when someone's lighting off fireworks in the-, in the Yeah. Like I watched this on the internet. Yeah. It looks almost fake, you know? Like it was, yeah, it's just like there's a smoke, smoke that's just sort of coming across the pitch and that's just from their flares. It, they are mental and they have like, you have a tunnel that you go down to go up and then you come up the stairs to get onto like underneath the athletics track onto mm -hmm. the pitch. And uh, as you're walking down either side, they have like riot police. I think it's a little bit like to intimidate you because no fans can get there really. But I, mean, I suppose if they stormed it, they could get down. So you're walking past, you just got these massive like six foot four um, police guys with helmets and big riot shields. And you're walking down thinking, we've got, we're about to play a football game here. So we're about to have a riot. Like it's crazy. Is it play some head games? Yeah, maybe, maybe yeah. it is like that. That's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's an interesting tactic for a team to send out the riot yeah. police to yeah, scare send out the riot you before you walk out. For, yeah. What about in terms of teams you play? Like what's been the toughest team you've ever played? Like the toughest lineup in your career so far? Oh, Manchester City like this year and well, like previous years. Manchester City are a different beast. And they just seem, you think each year, you think surely they've like reached the pinnacle now and then they just go again and impress everybody. Why, why again. do you think that is? It'll just be the mentality. And you can see, obviously, at Mikel Arteta was at City for a few times studying underneath mm -hmm. Pep Guardiola. And you can see that he's got that same intensity and just that if it's not good enough, he'll let you know. And yeah. you, you have to keep raising the standards and setting the bar high. And um, yeah, City just keep doing it year in, year out. And I, I mean, it's unbelievable. It. I, I don't know when that machine's going to stop or break down or anything. You know, like you had United with the change from Ferguson. They had a couple of years trying to figure it out and they seem to be back in a place now where there's a, there's a great leader with um, Ten Hag that's getting his style of football. Mm -hmm. His uh, discipline, I think, was a big thing for uh, mm -hmm. United. And you can say the same at Arsenal. And it's just, you can see that as soon as that's fixed, mm -hmm. things start to click. So yeah, they seem to, City just seem to have it and they're just going to be on a roll for a, a good number of years, I think. Yeah, they obviously have figured out something. Yeah, yeah. They, def they definitely are not easy to play against. No. Just from watching, I can just see how dominant they are. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the toughest player you've ever had to play against? So I'd go my very first Premier League game. And it might have just been because it was my first Premier League game. So it was my first taste at that speed and mm -hmm. that, that skill level. But I've always said uh, Coutinho when he was at Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, he was... He was one of them players, as I described, um, Odegaard before, drops into spaces that you're unsure of. Yeah. But he's still got that ability to quickly turn and, and shoot or slide passes past you. And it's just, mate, it's, they're the ones yeah, that are always- slide something around you and you yeah, thought it was going in. As a defender, if you have a striker that stands next to you all game, it's perfect. You don't have to worry about where he is too much. When you have one that's pulling off your shoulder or standing behind you and just jumping on side and then going, they're the trickiest ones because you constantly- on the turn. And then as soon as you're on the turn, you're not looking at the ball, they start playing it, they start running. So much head movement, so yeah, much field awareness. Honestly, so much like body shape dependent. It's, it's yeah. Crazy. What was the energy like playing against, you know, City? Yeah, so obviously that was this year yeah. away, it was, it was a huge one and it was at home as well. And I we, mean, we lost both games with 3-1 and 4-1, which was just like, the last one was devastating for us. Really, really hit us in the gut. But um, at their place, yeah, they were, they were, with, they knew what they needed to do to win the league. They had to beat us there to, or to have a chance to win the league. They had to beat us there. Yeah. So like they just had that, that desire. And I think we it sort of took us a bit by, well, we, I don't know by surprise because we knew it was coming, but it just sort of deflated us and we were, we were struggling to get into our rhythm a bit. Yeah. I mean, it, is it hard for a team like yourself with that many elite players to get into a rhythm? Because you obviously need everybody to be at the same speed. Mm -hmm. If one player is not really turning it on, yeah, I'm sure, sure it's hard for everybody to turn it on. For sure. And I'd been, because it had been such a successful season for us and coming up to the last sort of five games, just like a few people's performances had dropped off and you just sort of lost that fluidity of the team. And I think you could see that with some of the games. Yeah. Talk to me about sports. Like, do you follow other sports? Do you? Oh, yeah. Do you, yeah. I'm a, I, I love my NFL. I love my NFL. I watch, I'm a big 49ers fan. So really? Watch my, yeah, I watch my NFL. I love that. Um, who's, your, who's your favorite football player or NFL football player? George Kittle. Really? Yeah, I love there George we go. Kittle, man. He's the GOAT. Yeah, tight shout end. Out, shout out to Kittle. Tight end. University. Kittle's the man. <laughs> yeah, Kittle. Yeah, he's dominant in the NFL. Exactly. It was yeah. one play actually that really made me think like, yeah, that's the guy that I like. It was a few seasons ago. I think it was against the Seahawks in the playoffs. And he, he just caught it after like 10 yards. And then he's, Yards after the catch were just 
ridiculous. He was yeah. throwing people to the ground right oh, on the sideline. Yeah, the guy's got so much strength, yeah. and he's yeah, just a bull. He mental. runs through people. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. What made you like uh, the 49ers? 49ers was uh, an ex of mine was from up that way. Oh, wow. And like, her all family were 49ers, so we used to go and watch the 49ers all together, and I just bought into it. So even when you got rid of the girl, you still, I still stayed loyal. Still stayed, still stayed loyal. loyal. That's a good guy. I like to Faithful hear Faithful to the Bay, right? Yeah, I love that. I love that. In terms of like the U.S., like a lot of athletes in the U.S., like NBA players, they're always sharing their playlist. They're always talking about the music mm -hmm. they want to listen to yeah. before games. And we see that music and culture and sports all kind of go together. Absolutely. What kind yeah. of music do you listen to before you get ready for a game? Uh, so I'm not, I DJ in the in the changing room. So I've got, we have- Wait, you what? I'm the DJ for like the match day playlist. Like, like on an iPod or like turntables? Oh, like an iPod. No, okay. <laughs> on a turntable. Like you got so your, phone, that, yeah. your I got, iPhone plugged in on yeah, Spotify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you scared me for a second. Yeah. I thought I was with Tiesto. Okay. <laughs> I've got to be doing <laughs> okay. activation. I can't okay. be spinning. So, so you're, you're on the playlist duty. Yeah, yeah, playlist okay. duty. So that's got a lot of um, like Afro beats type of songs on. Okay. A lot of the lads are into that. Um, a few foreign songs, like your, your Portuguese and your Spanish songs. Oh, that's cool. Oh, you mix it up for the you whole got, team. You have to, yeah. And I then, like uh, that. That's thoughtful. And then, yeah, it'll get to a point where you're like 10 minutes before you're going out and we just ramp it up to like a little bit of like dance EDM music and just, just get it going. Get a little, little bit more, more of an energy going. Yeah. Because everyone's been sort of like chilling out, listening to like good songs, singing yeah. along. And then it's like, right, boom. It's and good, when that comes on, everyone, know, everyone knows like it's time to go. Yeah. I need, I need, maybe you could share me that playlist. Share that playlist. We could yeah. link that in the pod. <laughs> in terms of like events, are you more of a Coachella guy or a stage coach guy? Stage coach. I've literally just come back from Nashville. I was in Nashville last weekend for the CMA Fest. No way. Yeah. So you're a big country guy. I'm a country guy. Well, again, because of the ex. She has a ranch up in Sacramento and stuff. Oh my, the ex so, played a lot. Are you yeah, still she's talking dictated, to this ex? No, no, no. She's okay. dictated my uh, my American culture. Yeah. yeah, I can tell she played a big role in the way you look at sports, yeah. the way you look at but music. I'm, a, I like, I'm like a hip hop guy as well. Like oh, you are? R&B, hip hop guy. What well. kind of country music? So like the usual big big guys like Luke Holmes, Morgan Wallen, they just sort of dictate my playlist quite a lot. Um, yeah. Zach Bryan, I'm going to see in Denver this week. You, you got to listen to Brett Young. You listen to Brett Young? I know a few of his tunes. Uh, yeah, he's got a song, Just Went Gold, You Didn't, amazing song. Brett Young's actually an amazing guy, supports Jackson. Uh, I, I love everything he's doing and his his concerts, his his festivals. Like when he performs, the, the environment's nice. It's a yeah, good, yeah. friendly environment. Yeah, he's people, a great singer. He's got a great people voice. love his music, yeah. In terms of like sports in the US, we see like Messi, Coming mm -hmm. over to the U.S. By the way, you think Messi is the greatest to ever play soccer? Oh wow, it's such a I, I get asked that, and it's hard because I grew up a United fan, and I grew up like watching Ronaldo before he went to Real Madrid, Ooh. and I like loved watching him mm -hmm. at United. I mean, who didn't? But I also like can appre like appreciated Messi when he was at Barcelona. Like he was just unstoppable. He just dribbled through the whole team and score. So he's there's totally different aspects to him. But yeah, it's so hard to. Decide. I'd say Messi's like the more naturally gifted, talented footballer. But Ronaldo will give you something like, I've never seen Messi score like as many overhead kicks or towering headers as Ronaldo, you know, comes in at the back post and just powers over people. Like he's got that aspect to him that I think gives him a, a level as well. So yeah, they're both, they're both great. And it's do you so think they're hard. tied or do you think- I'd say they're tied. They're tied. Yeah. The, I'll, I'd, I'd, I'd sit on the fence all the time. So yeah. if, you, if you had to pick your top three of all time and they're tied, so you get three more, who would you choose? Three people besides Messi and Ronaldo. Three people besides Messi and Ronaldo. Uh, Ronaldinho. Oh, wow. That's a good one. Henri. Yeah. And then... Are you, sure, I mean, this, are this you is, sure about him in the top three? This is my my era, though. Like, what I grew up watching. Yeah, it's not yeah, like yeah. I could go back and you say, like, Maradona and stuff yeah. in LA. But I'm like, I'm, I never really got to see them play. So yeah. it's, it's tough for me to throw them into something that I watched. Got it. So, like, obviously, Maradona, when you watch highlights of him and stuff, he's, he's amazing. I mean, yeah, I didn't get to watch he him either, amazing, but he's still but a goat. Like, yeah. In the terms of, like, the football that I grew up watching. And then I'd, uh, I'd throw Rooney in there as well. Really? I love Rooney. He makes yeah. top three. I loved Rooney. I think he just had everything. Yeah. He had that he had that grit and that like yeah. fight in him as I was I would think with your beautiful hair and nice jawline, you'd go with David Beckham, but Oh no. I, I, mean, I, guess, I, did I like, guess I did like best. I guess I did he didn't like make best, the cut. But, no. So we see Messi come to the MLS and he goes to Beckham's team and you see Inter Miami just, you know, explode. Yeah. If you had to play in the MLS, like where would you want to go? I'd I'd go Nashville SC. Oh wow. And I'd Go somewhere on the on the West Coast. Because uh, San Diego actually have a team coming out in 25. They have an expansion team. So I'm like, I'm like eyeing up that. <laughs> Do you think that MLS is starting to now be considered a serious playing option for top elite talent? For sure. And I feel like they, they need people to come in younger as well. Rather than just like, you like some Messi and like Zlatan when they came and, and Gerard and Beckham. These are more like showing things. Showy, yeah. but like at the end of the careers, like the 30... 
34, 35 year olds. They still you dominate know? everybody. They'll still, yeah, they still obviously are good enough to rip it up and stuff. But I feel like the MLS will, will slowly, you'll see, especially with the World Cup in 26, you'll slowly see like foreigners coming over at a younger age and having more successful careers and the level of the, yeah. the play will go up. In a respectful way, just for people that don't really understand soccer and football, what is the difference between like the Premier League and like MLS? I'd say pace and skill level at times. And when you say pace, you mean the actual speed of players? Like just, the actual speed? The no, literal like the speed, speed of the play. I'd okay. say like the players, there'll be, there'll be rapid players here in the MLS and there'll be rapid players in the, in the Premier League. But I mean the speed of the ball movement and the way the game's played, I think that's that's the difference. That's the difference with the Premier League with most leagues in Europe. Really? Is the difference, like you look at the Premier League and an Italian league and the pace of the Premier League, you could have like the bottom two teams playing each other and it'll be a full-blooded, fast-paced, all-or-nothing game. Yeah, I guess it's interesting because a lot of people, it's hard to describe the difference between leagues when everybody's supposed to be professional, everybody's supposed to be elite, yeah. but I guess it is like the team play more. Yeah, and you see teams play like some players come over and adapt to it so quick and can join in the speed straight away. And other players, it takes like a year and then they, they finally like find the, find the feet in the league and find yeah. the base. Yeah, I mean, one of my good friends, and he's a Jackson athlete, Julian Araujo, went from Galaxy to Barcelona, mm -hmm. played his first game, and you could see him picking up the pace within the first couple of minutes yeah, and like, it, understanding the be, game. It'll yeah. be a totally different side for him because my, my friend, uh, John Bond, the goalkeeper at Galaxy, that's when I'd, so I went to watch Bondi play last year mm -hmm. and Aurelio was playing. So I was watching him and I was like, oh, he's got a bit. Uh, and now he's gone to obviously Barcelona. It'll take, it'll take him a little bit to just adapt to it. And, yeah. The great thing is he can speak the language as well. Yeah, so I like think he's possibly. on Team Mexico this week. They're playing against Team USA. They've got the Gold Cup coming yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that's, what day is it? I think they played last night in Vegas. Did they play last night? Or yeah, I know it, the national I think team it's tomorrow night. night in Vegas. Yeah, something I like think, that. Maybe. In terms of like uh, the World Cup, going into the World Cup and people are kind of like getting ready for, you know, a lot of players retire after they play their World Cup game or retire going into that era, that yeah. year. What are like some career goals that you have when it's all said and done, you want to know, hey, when I retire, I want to know I hit these goals. Yeah, the um, I mean, that would have been great this year if we won the Prem, because that would have been a big goal. Win the, win the Premier League would have been a massive goal. Um, international football, I've represented my country at under 21 level, still waiting for the full call up. But that would be something to be nice. I mean, I'm 27, so I've got, few years still like, yeah absolutely to get there um, they're, they're probably my two big goals in terms of in terms of my career right now and then in terms of like the premier league is there anyone else that you want to play with like in the league right now in the league right now if i had to choose someone from another team yeah to come and join me Ooh. that is a good one i'm trying to think of like center halves to play alongside and just get a feel for how they are as a teammate so, like virgil van dyke could be one mm -hmm. get a feel for how he is mm-hmm um, what make what makes him being a player that you want to play with? He's he's been he's dominated for the last five years in the prem. Mm -hmm. Looked effortless. That's what scares me. Is yeah. how effortless it looks for him. He's got like a crazy finesse. Yeah, and he's just sometimes just so laid back and looks someone, like he's not even trying. Yeah, and someone's trying to run him, whereas I'd be like struggling. I'd be like fighting together. Yeah, he's just cruising and cleaning it up. Yeah, so that'd be a good one. Um, and I'll, I'll choose a striker as well. I'd love to play with Kevin De Bruyne oh, if yeah. he could if he could join. Yeah. I, I think he's he's a special player, a special talent. So to kind of like rapid fire a little bit, I want people to kind of get to know you a little bit more, give yeah. you uh, not so much time to think about these. Yeah. I'm going to say a question. You're going to kind of give me the first thing that comes to your mind oh. or your answer. All right. Okay. So favorite meal. Uh, favorite meal, uh, Indian. Favorite place to travel. Uh, West Coast. Favorite music artist. Oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, Margo Mullen. That's a good one. Favorite hobby? Um, oh, favorite hobby? Oh, music, listening to music. I don't know what else to do. I thought I don't you were going to say DJing DJ, underground yeah, clubs yeah. in London. Uh, <laughs> what brings you happiness? Um, winning football games. Best compliment you've ever received? Uh, ooh, best compliment I've ever received? I don't know, that's a tough one, that. I mean, come, oh, rapid fire, though. Maybe that one that you just said then. you got great jawline, the great hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look like a model. Yeah, we'll, just, we'll, we'll, I, we'll I gave him his one. best compliment he's ever received. <laughs> <laughs> best advice you've ever received? Um, always enjoy yourself when you're playing. That's the best advice I'd give as well. Really? Yeah. Why is that? 
because people get so stressed out and when they get stressed out, they go inside themselves and they, they really struggle to just perform to the best. Mm -hmm. They always keep that happiness and that enjoyment in it. And you'll be surprised with how well you start to perform. The worst advice you've ever received. Um, you got to get angry sometimes. Like, I am quite a chilled out guy and people have said like, you need to be a bit more angry and a bit more aggressive with yourself. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm good, you know, like, I'm making it work how I yeah. want to do it. Like that's yeah. my style. I'm not going to change it like that. I'd yeah. Say that's do you think that in the league that you're playing in and at the level you are, you're at the highest level in football, you've made it. So as a kid growing up, your dreams come true, right? <laughs> yeah. You're here. Sometimes it's probably hard to soak it in for a second and relax and mm -hmm. breathe and appreciate the blessings, but you've made it. You're at the highest level of sport that you could possibly play mm -hmm. for you as an athlete. What is the mental part? Like, how do you mentally kind of stop for a second and relax and appreciate that and block out the noise? Yeah, that's actually a great question. So like when I played my first FA Cup final, we had like a psychologist at the club and he, he took a moment and just said to me, when you go out there, and obviously first time at Wembley, crowds, Chelsea, mm -hmm. Arsenal, massive, one side's red, one side's blue. Before you start your warm up, just walk to the center circle and just like have a look around and just take it in. And then not you won't be intimidated by it when you come out to, to play. And uh, I did that and I felt comfortable. And it just sort of took a few moments to have a couple of breaths and just like, this is big time and with you obviously you're an elite I get goosebumps player now, like, yeah i can see about it, you're, you're you're an elite player and you're at the highest level like i said how do you block out now the noise of the crowds and the internet and instagram and social yeah. media and oh, the, the yeah. fans and how do you block some of that i'm sure it, there's ups and downs with that right massively massively there's, i mean this year has been like a huge up and then towards the end just became a massive down on my like in like social media pages personally and i have like quite a few things blocked and you can't tag me in photos if you don't follow, if I don't follow you. Yeah. You can't comment if I don't follow you. So like there's yeah. a lot of restrictions because it was just becoming a lot and I needed to just shut it out because it was dictating a lot of how I was going about my days and how I was thinking. Does it affect your happiness, your mood? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I normally always thought myself as quite a happy, happy chappy, you know, like. Just happy happy guy, chappy. Happy like chappy, that. that's very English saying that yeah, one, yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So, so like, is there certain practices like yoga or meditation or things you do to kind of relax and get your mind right? We, I used to do a bit of like the Headspace, you know the Headspace app? No. Yeah, it's like some meditation app. And I used to, I used to do a bit on that, just thought okay. that'd help settle and calm you down a bit yeah. if you were getting a bit overwhelmed. Do you do you let that noise kind of get to you or do you think you figured out a way to block it and move on? Yeah, you try not you try not to. I think there's times when you you drop back into old habits and like you, you start looking for it and like reading it and then you're like, oh, why did I do that? Yeah. You know, so it's about being like strong mentally and strong will not to yeah. even bother checking. I mean, we see everybody from athletes, celebrities, they get so caught up on the internet. People get yeah. so caught up on thoughts and opinions people have. It's like, you don't know these people. You've yeah. never met these people. They don't dictate your money, your life. They don't dictate if your parents love you or your girl loves exactly, you. Yeah. They they dictate nothing in your life. Mm -hmm. And they're allowed to give comments and opinions 24, seven, seven days a week. If you let them get to you, you're, they're gonna win. Yeah, and you've probably read like seven messages of people loving you. And then that one message at the end that might have been like, whatever. The only one that kills you. That's the only one you're focused on. And you're like, think about the seven. Yeah. Like, see the roses, yeah. not the fawns. Right? Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, it's good. I mean, obviously if you're an elite level athlete you have to be able to separate that and mm. focus more on the good because yeah. there's always going to be your day when you're down yeah and that's yeah. part of life you got to just keep going and keep moving in terms of this year we're wrapping up the podcast you're going into a new season next year this year's mm -hmm. done this season's done yep um what can we expect from you what can we look for what what is the next chapter of your career yeah so i'll go back obviously go back to london end of this month mm -hmm. and we start pre-season pretty much the next day straight away and we'll go to germany for a week get our fitness up and then we come to the states will be games at the MetLife against United um, in Washington, D.C. against the MLS All-Star. That's that's cool. That was actually my first game for Arsenal in my first preseason. No way. So, yeah, Drogba was playing. We, oh, we wow. played at... Um, How was I that? I think it was Dignity Health, actually. Or it might have been San Jose. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it was sick. Like They had the fly over the national anthem. And that's another one where I was like, oh, this, is, this is big time. So I'm looking forward to the All-Star game. And then, um, and then we play Barcelona at the SoFi. Which oh, that's good. Be, I might have to show up for that one. Yeah, because that's going to be the first time they've had a soccer game there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to need field passes for that. Me and my yeah, camera guy, you're going cool. to have to hit up the team yeah, and let them know yeah, Bears coming. <laughs> so are we are we looking forward to watching you play in the Premier League again this season? Yeah, I'll be back, I'm back at Arsenal. I've got another year left on my contract, so I'll be there for at least another year. And uh, hopefully this is the year that we, we bring the trophy. 
I love that. I so the, that so goal. the goal this year is bringing home the trophy. Bringing home the Premier League. Yeah, That's it. Sure. Amazing. I'm Bear DiGidio. This is another amazing podcast. We have one of the legends, one of the biggest soccer superstars in the world. And I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Don't forget, like, comment, subscribe. Check out all the rest of the episodes. Jackson Podcast. Chase, appreciate you.